Hey, so um, the last couple of days I spent most of this week looking through texts. Um, I've learned it in quite a bit different way than I normally would learn a piece. Um, normally I'd try to focus on a very small area as I learn the notes and find immediately how I want to play them. Uh, this, this work is quite a bit different uh, and the process is very different because I'm not working uh, with one score that I have, that I just have the notes, I can say that's what I have to play, how do I play it now, what problems do I have and how do I solve them. This is something quite unique because I'm working from five different scores. Um, the original manuscript of Bach, the uh, transcription for piano solo left hand by Brahms, Bassoni's arrangement for both hands, Lipses and Semenov's uh, Bayern versions. So when this happens, I can't just uh, learn a small phrase and play that and then try to get the right sound. I have to work a bit more broadly because I have to choose which notes I play. Uh, do I have the hand span to play all these chords in uh, one variation or one area? Or do I have to remove some? Uh, there's no point in including a voice and practicing that perfectly for one bar when the next two bars I realize I can't do that, I can't use that voice anymore or I have to substitute it in the left hand or the right hand, or have to make some other uh, option or arrangement. So I've just been mostly learning a few variations and trying to just play the text, see what decisions I have to make for the text. And now I've had a bit of time to sit with it, I can decide which pieces, uh, which way I want to play it. So the Chacon, it's um, very similar to the Passacaglia, the origins of the piece. Um, you can search it up yourself. But it's mostly, um, let's say, for a funeral and walking pace kind of thing. That's the, well, that's the definite Passacaglia. Uh, the terms are kind of interchangeable, Chacon and Passacaglia. Um, the origins of them from, uh, I think, Spanish dance, and there's, I forget the other influence, but there's two or three um, influences that made them. Um, they've been used interchangeably for by many composers. Um, often they'll be organ works. Um, Bach uh, wrote, wrote both, uh, Pascalia and Chacon. And um, he doesn't name or list the variations. Um, I think Semenov has, so for that I'll use um, use variations because that terminology does exist. But on the original manuscript, there is no indication of uh, where a variation starts or stops. But it's normally agreed that it's a four-bar tetrachord, a descent of D, C, B flat, A. Um, so. When deciding to, to play this piece, you have to look about the origins of it, what it was written for, when it was written. It was written in 1720, in Koth while Bach was in Cothen, and he wrote it for solo violin. Now, we should keep in mind that this is for Baroque violin, with Baroque bow, not a modern violin. Uh, so, even if you hear a violinist play it now, that's not exactly um, what was being played, or how it was being played when it was written. So we do need some fidelity to Bach's score. That's very, very important. But we also have to be aware that what we say fidelity now wasn't considered as such in that period. Uh, there's many examples of Baroque works being used on all instrumentation. Uh, a lot of the times it wasn't written what instrument was played. Um, even Bach would write for clavier not for harpsichord, not for organ, it would be open. So there is a lot of flexibility and there is a big history of transcriptions, of uh, Bach transcribing his own pieces between different instruments, and Bach actually using other people's uh, repertoire. So in this piece, I'm playing a transcription of a transcription of a transcription, piano for Bayern, uh, piano accordion, off violin, off of piano arrangement, off of violin, baroque violin arrangement. So, 
that does give us a bit of leeway, a bit of freedom. But we should try to be authentic and honest and then I think authentic but also honest to the interpretation. What can the instrument do? Uh, what can it do? And afterwards we can make a choice. Uh, but I think it's better to make the choice because we've decided something, because we know why we're making the choice, rather than just letting the instrument decide or playing something out of ignorance. So very quickly I'll just have to turn the camera around. This is the the original manuscript of um, Bach for violin, the Bassoni's version, and at the moment I just have um, Semenov's version. So I'll take a screenshot of the um, manuscript, because I think the manuscript gives a lot of hints and clues. Um, the text, if we look just the text now, we have this. <laughs> So that's just the text, no interpretation, no nothing. So it's very important to think now for the violin. How Bach wrote this was a minim with a dotted crotchet and a quaver. Quaver and then again minim. So Bach was a very, very accomplished violinist, very accomplished, and knew exactly how to write for the violin. But as he's written it here, it's not possible to play on the violin. So he automatically has left the decisions up to the player. He doesn't say anything. In fact, throughout the manuscript, he writes nothing. The only two words he uses are arpeggio twice. That was the only decision he, he left up to the player. Uh, sorry, the only decision he didn't leave up to the player. He didn't say how to play them, but he just said these are these are arpeggios. So a bit, a bit about the violin. It's all written in double stops when you play two notes. And obviously you can't have a minim, the double stop, and play again this A. So we have the effect, or you have two choices. Or so the, the player actually has to decide how they want to play it, if they have the technique, to choose which notes they're going to double and stop. Now, Bach wrote this piece in D minor, it's, it seems quite clear, because of the open strings of the violin, which are G, D, A, E. So this open... So the second bar of the piece is just E, the top note E, and that's going to ring. So that will make a little bit of decision making easier for me. So if I'm thinking of the violin now, there's going to be an attack and a decay of the notes as they have to go bum, bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum. So as I sing it, there's a few notes that have to de decay and they're normally the repeated notes. So if we have this rhythm, so every note has to have an attack because it's repeated. So now if I'm thinking to play this, we have this. I would divide it to have the A. So we have this pickup note to find the next bar, so that kind of gives us a breath. Now we have a repeated E of a crotchet and a dotted crotchet. So that would on the violin have a big bum, bum, two double stops to hit the notes. Okay, that's the sound they're probably going to have. And we have the possibility to let the note... 
but I think that kills the purpose because the purpose of the open string is to have the sound resonate. Uh, sorry, open string is you can play the note without pressing a fret or um, anything on the, the I, I forget the violin terms. So you don't have to press anything on the string. So when you release the string, the note stops normally. The open string, it will ring and have a reverb naturally. So in my opinion, this open E gives us the permission to not let the note decay. We'd have the first one, stop. And then afterwards. So in that way, my idea of the theme would be something like this. So that is the basis. The logic of why I'm doing it is because of the mechanics of the violin and the uh, acoustics. So in that way... And there's another point that gives another reason or validation. We don't have to... We can keep this... Keep that going because we have a, the chord change on it. And that will give the effect of... So we have... So at the moment I'm just fumbling through how I would see a violin bowing. So that gives us a little bit of freedom to have. the same problem does the sustain of those notes continue um, maybe just for a crotch it's written uh, a little bit longer as a minimum but obviously the violin can't play those notes for that long so that's the decision making behind so the bass of course will add a completely different structure to this with the ear usage do we let it, the bass take over? And which notes are we trying to decay on? And how much do we have? Okay, so when we listen to the end of a, a note, we have this reverb that we're trying to create. Otherwise, the accordion is on off. Okay, so the most important part, if I'm trying to emulate this, this reverb or a little bit of sustain, but to have a decay of the note, I have to remember that the violinist is going ba dum, ba dum, ba dum. So there's a lot of movement. As soon as they hit that note, they're preparing the next movement. So it's the same thing. We're, we're playing the same notes, but we need to prepare automatically. <laughs> As soon as we've played that note, we have to be moving to prepare the air for the next bellow because the problem with the instrument we have, we have to start again the bellow. So we have, because we can't wait for the instrument to respond. Because if you just watch this, the sound's quite flat. Bum, and ba, ba. I want a little bit more color, a little bit more definition. So there's preparation before. 
and I want the preparation for the the new first beat. Bum, 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 ba da 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 bum, bum, bum. So as much as the violin would would play like as they do, we also have to think how we would breathe, how we would anticipate the mechanics of the instrument influencing us. So again, the thema, I think too much. There's a danger because the original score is written here. High register for the violin and uh, from, actually I think Brahms, well anyway, the first, I think even Mendelssohn's transcription lowered the uh, the piece by an octave. I, I know Brahms for sure did it, for, uh, did it before Bassoni. Obviously he wrote it beforehand. But Bassoni followed this um, instruction. So we have a completely different texture. Uh, um, so the danger is when we're doubling this D that the, the, the sound will be quite... That's not even pulling very much. That's just the mechanics of the... So that's quite forceful. Even in bassoon in a single, uh, actually I'm, or, or I'm in my master register in the bass. But we have to be careful. We have enough air for the notes to activate. But still under control and not a, a rude sound. Uh, something quite, um, not mellow, but hidden. We don't want all the... Um, full sound of the instrument to, to explode at once. We want we want some colour in the notes. And that that note is a problem for me because it's the first note we don't have with the bass, and that's a colour by itself. And I still want that same. I think that's how I want it. A little bit of a little feel like a bum, bum, bum. But we won't have the same uh, color as before uh, because because we uh, miss the the harmonics. It sounds very empty because it's only one note, and before we have four notes for every. So, um, bum, bum. But that sounds flat, so maybe it has to be shorter, and the release probably of the note should be up. Uh, so that's the release of the finger uh, with the sound. Okay, so that's my uh, thoughts working through this piece. I'm still not sure what register I'll use. Um, might be bassoon to keep it very simple, but I, I might add a uh, piccolo or something, a combination, maybe bassoon and one clarinet. Uh, I'm not sure just yet because I, I have to have time to sit. So I'll make some decisions now as I want to play the phrasing, the ideas, the flowing, but I'll let that sit. And I'll probably change it in um, a couple of days or a week or a month from now because I'll I'll find a new sound I want. I'll find some articulation I think is better. And I think that's uh, what we have to do. We have to be very flexible when we're learning the text. We have to find what we want to do, uh, find what we can do, find the way to get there, and then be flexible with after we've listened to the result to try and develop it better. And progress more. So hopefully this is a little bit more insightful, uh, explaining uh, the thoughts um, and how to include uh, the history of the piece, the mechanics of the original instruments, uh, looking at the different versions and how you can implement them um, on the accordion, uh, including its mechanics and sound creation. Hope you enjoyed. <laughs>